Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar again, hosted by the LIMS Forum. My name is Dinah Ramirez and I'm your moderator for today. Today's webinar, A Guide for Laboratory Systems Management, is part seven of a webinar series that's been presented by Joe Laskowski. Today we'll be focusing on laboratory processes. So while you go ahead and take some time to introduce yourself in the chat, let's introduce our speaker today. If you're joining us for the first time in the series, Joe is an experienced laboratory automation and computing professional with over 40 years experience in the field, including the design and development of automation systems, LIMS, robotics, and data interchange standards, and consults on the use of computing in lab work. He currently works with companies to establish planning programs, for lab systems, develop effective support groups, and helps people with the application of automation and information technologies in research and quality control environments. We're so excited to have Joe with us here again for part seven in his series. So let's check in with Joe and we'll get started. All right, Joe, thanks for joining us today. The floor is yours and you can go ahead and unmute your microphone. All right, thank you very much. Thanks and welcome to the seventh session in this series. We're going to continue looking at laboratory processes as a continu continuation of our discussion on laboratory informatics, and this will include the roles of education of, of lab personnel. As we've noted in these webinars, this companion book will provide useful background information on the technologies, support, and other factors that can impact your ability to effectively use these systems. It should prove to be a useful reference as these webinars have gotten into more technical detail. Much of the material in this session is expanded upon in Chapter 1 and also the appendices of the book. In this session, we'll be concluding the series by looking at laboratory processes and what it takes to plan, implement, and demonstrate that they're operating as described, all from the standpoint of laboratory automation. We'll also look at why the regulatory guidelines are an essential factor in successfully carrying out laboratory operations. During the previous six sessions, we began by introducing laboratory informatics, working our way through the return on investment, support issues, and instrument data systems and their characteristics. Now we're going to move into what people normally see as laboratory work, stuff that goes on the lab bench. One lab I spent a lot of time in was divided into two areas. The instrument lab where we minimized the exposure of equipment to things that were flammable, corrosive, or otherwise potentially harmful to the expensive stuff. And the wet lab where all that material lived and was used. This session is going to focus on the process side of laboratory work. Laboratory work usually, almost always, begins with the descriptions of manual processes. They may be developed internally or built upon published material from a variety of sources. This is where the science in laboratory work is, takes precedence. These are the scientific methods. The work that is being discussed in this webinar series is about laboratory informatics and automation. So we need to bring those subjects together along with that of laboratory procedures. There are a number of reasons to get involved with lab automation. The one we've pushed against so far is productivity, and that includes improving people's ability to use the results of laboratory work. There are others, including working safely with hazardous materials or in environments that aren't kind to human life. In addition, we may want to add new capabilities or more sophisticated techniques. These interests can apply to any laboratory environment. While most of this material will focus on productivity, we aren't ignoring the safety issues. As it turns out, most of what we can do to improve productivity also improves safety. So what are the options for improving productivity? In order to answer that, you have to define your goals. Unless they're defined, it'll be a bit like conversations I have with my wife. Let's go somewhere and get a change of scene. Where? I don't know, anywhere you'd like to go? You need direction, and that depends on the problems you want to solve. Hiring more people isn't always a good way to improve productivity, in part because of the poor return on investment when compared to other methods. More people means more space and more equipment. 
It also increases management's workload and the costs associated with people's employment. The remainder of this session is going to be focused on automated systems. The work I've been doing recognizes three types of automation shown on the screen. Much of this discussion in the first six webinars has covered the concepts be behind computer-assisted lab work, where computer systems have been an aid in managing data, information, and laboratory operations. Computer-controlled processes is where we are now, looking at the use of automation to carry out sample preparation and experiment or procedure execution. There was some overlap with computer-assisted lab work when we addressed instrument data systems. Scientific manufacturing and production systems tie everything together into one or more production streams. Different lab processes can run in parallel with the results feeding into common centralized database systems. Depending on the type of lab work you're doing, this can range from easily feasible to wishful thinking. Labs that have built their sample handling and processing using micro microplay technologies are pretty much there. Getting to that point is a matter of process engineering and recognizing that this is a direction you want to go and fostering the development of technologies that will get you there. This is the purpose of technology management and planning. There are pros and cons to using automated equipment. By and large, the benefits outweigh the costs or we wouldn't be sitting here. Among the costs are the equipment, which can range from improving individual steps to completely automated processes, training, integration with a lab workflow, which can include engineering costs depending on the scope of the processing, and validation requirements. And this point will come up frequently and we'll address it a bit later. The benefits do include higher productivity and more consistent results. As noted, implementations could range from stepwise improvements on up. There is one point that we need to keep in mind as we go through this webinar, and that is this, the paramount need to preserve the integrity of the science. This point needs to be tested frequently as plans are made and implemented. In all of this work, if the science is compromised, you haven't accomplished anything. This type of automation is what we refer to as computer controlled processes. It includes various forms of robotics and automated equipment designed to aid in sample preparation and introducing the samples and instruments. Laboratory robotics has been on the lab bench since the 1980s. Early offerings have had issues with marketplace acceptance due to the equipment compatibility issues and people's ability to successfully plan and implement working processes. The most successful applications today owe their usefulness to sample holder standardization and purpose-built engineering products. The illustration on the screen shows two examples of sample holders, holder systems, auto injector vials and the microplate. Sample vials have been adapted to a wide range of instrument applications. The simple standard geometry of the microplate has led to the development of compatible equipment for handling, sealing, incubating, dilution, and reading measurements of assays from several vendors. The basic array concept of the arrangement of the sample cells has been extended to the development of an integrated production system by Douglas Scientific that's shown in the lower right. While the microplate-based technology is usually found in life sciences applications, there is no reason why it can't be used in other industries. The plates are available in a variety of materials. One thing to be careful of is the effect of solvents on those materials. The only other potential issue is due to the small volumes of the sample cells, which could become a factor with non-homogeneous materials. Agilent has combined robotics with auto injectors that can be programmed to carry out common sample handling functions, such as dilution, internal standard addition, mixing, and so on within the vial before it's injected into an instrument. Companies like Formulatrix of Bedford, Massachusetts is developing automated cell culture suites with the goal of increasing productivity and reducing variability. Fluid Management Systems has designed purpose-built automated systems for sample preparation and solvent extraction. 
The equipment is shown is for B PCB analysis that can increase sample throughput by a factor of 10 over manual systems. The common feature that these systems have is that they're planned and engineered for their applications. The next step in computer controlled automation is the inter introduction of instrument data systems. This was covered in webinar 6. By combining the automated sample preparation with instrument data systems, we can achieve an automated production environment. What that gives us is the ability to implement a hierarchical control system that could cover sample preparation, introduction, measurements, along with data acquisition, storage, and reporting. We can add a LIMS or ELN as discussed in the earlier webinars to handle information management and administrative work. Those components provide one example of computer-assisted lab work as do chemical informatics, bioinformatics, statistical analysis, and so on. As a result of connecting those systems together, we move on to a higher level of productivity. That higher level is scientific manufacturing or production manufacturing systems. It's analogous to product manufacturing as both reflect the routine execution of the processes to produce result. In one case, it's a product for sale. In the other, information that will serve as a basis for decision making. Your ability to make that transition from manual to automated systems depends on a number of factors. The processes need to be stable, reliable, and validated. Most lab processes are developed as procedures carried out by people. We are considering changing that implementation to an automated system. This manual process will be the reference point for determining whether or not the automated system is functioning properly. The procedure should not undergo change. The planning for automated systems shouldn't begin until you have a stable process or else you'll be shooting at a moving target, one whose specifications are evolving and that will increase costs and reduce the likelihood of success. Another aspect of stability is the question of how long the procedure will be in use. There are automated systems that can be easily reconfigured and others that require extensive setup and checking. The procedure should be in place long enough to justify the cost of the automation. Tinkering with the process should be avoided as things can break or have variability introduced that compromises the integrity of the data. Note that tinking is different than evolutionary operation systems. The latter are planned and controlled variations in the procedures. All of the bugs in the manual process need to be worked out. The details of the process should be clearly written out without any undocumented workarounds or assumptions. If it isn't written down, it doesn't exist. The documentation should be sufficiently clear that, when, that someone could walk through the process without any special training. In fact, it would be a good idea for those doing the automated implementation to carry out the procedure so that they fully understand what's going on and raise any questions in the procedure's execution. Any sources of variability should be identified and resolved. Any points that are critical to the procedure's success should be identified. Points where particular attention needs to be paid to temperatures, timing, instrument settings, or any other appropriate factors. Reference samples should be identified so that they can be used to compare the manual and automated implementations. Acceptable reproducibility needs to be established. The process needs to be validated. We're going to go into more detail on this subject later in this session. It's a critical element of lab operations, and automation is no exception. The short description of validation is documented proof that something works. If you don't have that proof, what's the point of using an automated implementation? The project needs justification, clear reasons why the automation is taking place and how to judge its success. A need has to exist sufficient to justify the development cost with clear benefits and expectations. These will become particularly important when management becomes impatient with the project's pace of development. 
we also have to deal with people issues. We need people who are capable of analyzing, optimizing, and converting the manual process to an efficient automated system. Automated systems are different than manual implementations. The equipment is different, and the way things are handled will vary. The failures of, all, of early laboratory robotics stem from a few errors in thinking. People try to use the same equipment in manual methods, having the robots mimic their actions. Efficient automation requires a different approach, different equipment. It's analogous to moving from bench chemistry to large-scale chemical process engineering or mechanical engineering. We need to be careful that the redesign of the process implementation doesn't compromise the underlying science. We also need to deal with validation in process testing and controls. We need validation of the automated process for the same reasons as noted earlier. We want to ensure that the automated process is producing results that are consistent with the underlying science. The automated implementation requires built-in test points so that we can apply quality control and statistical process control to continually evaluate the system. Control charts, for example, would help track the process's performance and detect problems before they can compromise overall data integrity. Note that these same procedures should be used in routine manual execution of methods. Automation of lab procedures can improve lab operations and productivity, but it has to be done properly. Planning is essential, and the role of lab personnel is going to change. There is something that needs to be kept in mind. The purpose of automation and automated systems is not to replace people, but to strike a balance so that the routine, mundane aspects of lab work are accomplished efficiently and effectively while freeing people to apply their intellectual skills. Automation should be applied in concert with human intelligence. There is a psychological aspect to automation. Automation projects represent a change in the way lab work is being done. Lab personnel should be part of the project's design, definition, and planning. Their jobs are going to be affected directly. They are also the experts in the lab's operations, so their comments should carry a lot of weight. They should understand the goals and how, the jo how their jobs will be affected by the changes that are being made. And most importantly, they should understand that they'll still have jobs. Automation should be used to improve people's work and to avoid new hires. If your goal is to replace people, the project has already got one foot in failure. The people you need to help the project be a success will be those adversely affected by that success. So what is the role of lab personnel in the new automated lab model? To begin with, they may now have time they were looking for to investigate new methods and carry out more detailed analysis of lab information. Their role may include more time for helping people understand the results that they're providing. Evolutionary operations programs may be developed to provide systematic improvements in lab procedures, and this can include equipment upgrades. There is also the role of troubleshooting and evaluating the results of statistical analysis control methods. Overall, lab personnel will be in a better position to meet the de demands of data integrity and streamlining lab operations. Unless it is a procedure that will be rarely used, Planning should begin as soon as new methods are introduced into the laboratory. Our overall goal is to put the right technology in place when you need it. As the new or existing method is reviewed, notes should be made as to where incremental improvements are possible and what barriers exist to full automation. These can include equipment issues. There may be features of critical equipment that require a person to operate it and don't readily permit an automated solution. The next step is to look at the factors noted earlier and apply them to the method under consideration. This is initially a documentation effort, noting what technologies might be applied and what needs need to be sought out. This document should be under continual review so when the time comes to initiate a project, you're well prepared. The planning for the automated implementation, either stepwise with changing some manual work to automated components or a move to full automation should begin as soon as the method is devised. Once the method is proven, 
you may move quickly to automated implementations if the workload is substantial. If the implementation is somewhere in the future, then the change in workload has to be monitored continually. The implementation would start sufficiently early enough to be ready to go when the demand hits a critical point and you want the automation to be online. We need to be careful about how we implement automation in a series of steps or stages. You may find equipment that solves some productivity problems such as auto samplers or automated pipettes. The use of each component has to be evaluated, tested, and have the process revalidated to make sure that the method hasn't been compromised. In addition, people have to be educated in the use of these two components. Given the amount of work involved, you want these additions to be part of the full automation project so that the work and resources aren't wasted. Temporary fixes seem to last forever and their temporary designation may be used as an excuse to avoid proving that the process still works properly. We don't want to improve productivity at the expense of data quality. Fix the bottleneck approaches to improving productivity can be an issue if they simply shift the bottleneck to a new point in the process. You want these improvements to be far enough downstream in the process as possible to avoid that issue. The whole point of everything we've covered in this webinar series is the development of data and information and their management. What is the value of that data and information to you and your organization? How is it being used? It needs to be reliable. The book shown on the screen carries an interesting statement. The only thing worse than no data is data you can't trust. That's the crux of the situation. If you're going to produce data and information, it needs to be reliable. Decisions will be based on that data and information, and bad data leads to bad decision making. So how do we address that point? Basically, that is what the guidelines produced by various regulatory groups are all about. We'll come back to that in a bit, but the key element of that is validation. In its simplest form, validation is documented proof that something works. It's a process that begins with a statement of need and runs in parallel with the planning and implementation methods in both their manual and automated forms. If your work is challenged, this is one demonstration that you're on solid ground. Continual process monitoring and evaluation provide more support. The validation process begins with a statement of need. Why are we doing this? What do we expect to gain from it? How does this fit in with other lab processes? That last point is not part of the original description, but something I added to reflect the scope of what's being covered in this series. It's important because lab processes can become electronically connected and what happens in one process can have an effect on the others. Process validation projects should include the elements shown on the screen. And the first point raises a question. What do you do if the process doesn't exist? Or if you're trying to figure out how to go about creating an automated system? How does that initial trial and error or experimental work fit in? That is what prototyping is about. That is the effort to figure out what the science is, how things work, and what equipment you need. Basically, it is the experimental part of developing processes, methods, and procedures. The end result should be that clear, detailed description. That was the first bullet in the previous slide. One important facet of proto prototyping processes is, development, is the development of specifications for equipment needed to implement that process. When we are looking at process validation, there are two points that need to be clear. Processes are validated. Equipment is qualified to work in that process. During the processes development, you may find a need for an instrument, device, or computer system that has certain characteristics or specifications. Those specifications provide a basis for evaluating candidates and making a selection. Once they are qualified for use, they become part of the process being validated. It's a basic, what do I need to do the job? What characteristics should it have? Followed by a search and evaluation of potential vendors and products. The scope of validation efforts in the lab isn't limited to the process we've been discussing in this session alone but it covers the full range of activities in the lab and their interactions with other systems. 
Validation is just one aspect of the material that's found in guidelines and specifications produced by a number of regulatory bodies in the United States and international groups. The purpose of those guidelines is to ensure that laboratory work is done properly and that the results are supportable and reliable. Occasionally you can still run into people that hold the idea that validation is an optional process that only needs to be addressed if someone's going to review what you're doing. One common phrase is, well, we're in research, so we don't have to validate. That completely misses the point of what laboratory practices should be. The only difference between regulated and non-regulated labs is who does the enforcement and evaluation of the lab's adherence to appropriate guidelines. In non-regulated labs, the enforcement is internal. In regula regulated labs, the enforcement is a regulatory body. So why does this matter? The whole point of lab work is to produce knowledge, information, and data. Those results will be used to determine the direction of research projects, whether or not products are suitable for shipment, if incoming materials are qualified for use in a lab or production processes, and to answer critical questions that affect your organization's operations. How much is good, solid, reliable data worth to you? What's the cost of missing a potential drug candidate or of having a product recalled because of production problems? This is part of what the data integrity issue is all about. Developing data via sound procedures by qualified people and proven processes and products. Data integrity is not something that's layered into lab processes. Support for it has to be designed into your systems and workflow. During the course of this webinar series, we began with a description of key informatics technologies and looked at the options for implementation and the ramifications. We also considered the factors that contribute to return on investment and how to evaluate them. Throughout the series, support issues and education found their way into most of the material. We then looked at instrument data systems and the options available to you in picking them and how they fit into overall lab informatics architectures. It's important to note that you shouldn't simply buy what's offered, but make sure you really understand the products and how they fit into your needs. This concluding session, review the concerns for process and implementation and the engineering of automated systems to meet the lab's productivity needs. I hope this system has been of use to you. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you, Joe. While we wait for any questions or comments to come through, we do have a few questions that Joe frequently receives on this topic that he'd like to address. So we'll go ahead and address those questions. Okay, Joe, so uh, one of the questions that you get frequently is, isn't the emphasis on automation to basically replace people? It can be, but that's a wrong way to use a technology. The people you might be replacing are those that can be best suited to support and manage automated systems. The ideal goal of automation is to support, is the support of human activities, using automation to improve productivity and offload repetitive manual work, letting people have more time to think, analyze, and plan their future work. What you want to create is a synergistic human-machine combination that takes advantage of the best of people and technology. Okay, thank you for addressing that. And another question that you get often is when you say people's thinking has to change, what do you mean exactly by that? Uh, let me give you one example. People's consideration for product choices tend to be focused on solving individual problems in isolation. It's the, what do I need to solve this problem? To be really productive, solutions uh, to needs have to be viewed as part of an interconnected lab-wide workflow. That particular problem may be repeated in other procedures, and if you're going to solve it, do so with the broader applications in mind. Is the solution a temporary one, or will it be useful in the long term? Should we be considering the long term issue with more intention? And also whether or not other laboratories are dealing with the same problem. You may be able to come up with solutions that can deal with multiple laboratory problems at a lower cost. Okay, thank you for addressing that as well. Another question that you get is, my company is trying to reduce the cost for regulatory compliance and 
you are saying we need to increase compliance, but how do I sell that to management? That's a pretty common issue. It's basically risk analysis. Uh, as we talked about earlier in the presentation, what's the cost of bad data and what's the impact? Uh, we've noted things like product failures and recalls and missed opportunities because of bad data. The problem is that when you deal with automation and you avoid testing and validation, you may be putting, system, putting in systems that produce bad data more effectively. That compounds the risk analysis to the point where all data is suspect. So how do you make good decisions in a bad environment? Uh, well, I talked to one individual a while back who was complaining that his test results in his research were get, becoming somewhat suspect. They were kind of curious because the numbers weren't coming out right. And they found out the problem was caused by the incoming raw materials. Uh, one of the solutions that they worked with was supposed to have certain characteristics, and it didn't. It wasn't manufactured properly. So it's all part of the process. You need to make sure that you're working with tools that actually do what they're supposed to do. Great. Thank you so much for addressing that common issue, Joe. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in from the chat. So, you know, at this point in time, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar as well as this webinar series, uh, which had seven webinars. I went ahead and provided the series recordings link. If you follow the link that I just shared with you in the chat box, you'll see that it will take you to all of the recordings for this series. Now, we will add today's webinar to the recordings uh, landing page, so you'll also be able to access it there. Feel free to share the link to all of the recordings with others that may be interested in these topics. So, Joe, is there anything else that you would like to cover before we go ahead and wrap up today's webinar? Um, only the point that I, if you have missed any point, any parts of the webinar series, that you go back and take a look at them. What we've been looking at is a different approach to dealing with laboratory technologies, and that is planning and engineering systems as opposed to taking a science process and just looking at a different way of doing it. Uh, the emphasis is going to be more and more on productivity and automation. And just like manufacturing systems, we need to start thinking differently about how work actually gets done, how things get streamlined and implemented so they're producing a good product. Uh, for those of you who have been with us for the entire series, thank you very much. And if you have any questions or comments, my name and address are on the, on the screen, so feel free to contact me. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe, and everyone who's attended. So, Joe, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you throughout this series, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care, everyone.